So as our final example, we're going to work the classic case of a bar in pure bending using our formal tensor notation. So again, our problem here is just we have our cross-sectional area in the xy plane, the length of our bar in the yz plane, and we're going to apply a moment to it. Now if you recall from our previous analysis, what we derived pre previously was that the normal stress in this beam followed the formula that the normal stress was given as the moment times y over i, where y is the distance from the neutral axis, which in this case for a square cross-section just lies right along the center, and i is the moment of inertia. So if we take this as our state of stress, we can easily write the stress tensor. So this form of the stress tensor assumes that we just have a normal stress, which is following this linear stress distribution. So if that's in fact our stress tensor, then our strain tensor follows from that. Which has the following form, where I've just factored out the factor of M and I. We have 2G, which is our shear modulus. And then we have the stress tensor minus this component, which is related to the trace of the stress tensor. And the trace of the stress tensor is just the sum along the diagonal, so just this one term, so just y everywhere along the diagonal. If we use our relationship between the shear modulus and Young's modulus, this, can, this form of the strain tensor simplifies. And it simplifies to the following form. Now, once we have our strain tensor, just as in our previous examples, we can use the strain tensor to compute the displacement gradients. The displacement gradients have the following form because we just have the values along the diagonal here. So it's quite simple. So now we can integrate these, but we have to be a little bit careful because we have constants of integration, which could potentially be functions of x, y, and z. And so here are our final relationships just from simply integrating. So for the horizontal displacement, uh, this term is a function of y, so we pick up a y, x when we integrate with respect to x. But that also means there could be some arbitrary function which depends only upon y and z as our constant of integration when I integrate only with respect to x. For the vertical displacement, uh, it depends upon y, so when I integrate with respect to y, I pick up a y squared over 2. And again, my constant of, in of integration, c2, could depend upon x and z. And finally, the z displacement, w, uh, I have a function of y, so I pick up a yz when I integrate with respect to z. And again, my constant of integration could be a function of xy. Now we're going to use a few of our observations to simplify things before we go further. So if you remember when we looked at our bar in bending, this is my z direction. And when I bend it, even very extremely, you notice that these lines here stay straight, right? They kind of spread out radially around the arc, but this, the vertical lines here stay straight. And so what that means is that the, the displacement in the, y, in the w direction, right, in this direction, shouldn't have a component that depends upon its place in the plane, because if it did, then that means we would expect to see these lines kind of squiggle, right? That, one, that it would stretch out here and go there, and there might be some kind of curvature. But since we see these straight lines being straight, we can kind of assume from that that, there's, that this constant of integration is going to have to be zero. So now the question is, how do we find these other two constants, C1 and C2? Well, we have to consider the shear strains, right? Because in this assumed form of our strain tensor, there is no shear strains. And the lack of shear strain is something that shows up in our experiment, because shear strain means if I had any kind of shear, my 90 degree lines wouldn't stay 90 degrees, but actually they do. So even though they curve, if you looked very carefully, you would see that the intersection point is always 90 degrees. When we look at the top of the beam, we see the same thing. So that 90 degree angle is preserved. So we're pretty confident in saying that there's no shear strains within this beam in pure bending. And so now we have to use the fact that there's no shear strain and that will allow us to find our constants C1 and C2. So here's, all, here's a summary of all we know about our displacement in the X, Y, and Z direction.
So we don't know these two functions, C1 and C2, but we do know that the shear strains need to be zero. So in the XY, XZ, and YZ plane, uh, given by the following displacement gradients. So all we need to do is substitute these in and see what they tell us. So let's start with this one here in the XY direction. So I just need to take the derivative of U with respect to Y, and you can see that this term here depends on Y, so I'm gonna pick that up. And so now when I take the derivative with respect to Y, I pick up this term and this term, which I just represent as the partial derivative of C1 with respect to Y. Now I need to take the derivative of the vertical displacement with respect to x, but there's no x here, so I only pick up a term from c2. Now let's move on to the xz plane. I need to take the derivative of u with respect to z and w with respect to x. Now here I only pick up one term because there's no x dependent in our z displacement and the only, and the only z dependence in our u displacement comes through this term here. Finally, let's do the yz plane. So there we are, we've computed our uh, shear strains and we know these have to equal to zero. So let's see what we can figure out. This equation might be the simplest one because we just have the derivative of c1 with respect to z being zero, which means that c1 could only be a constant in z. Uh, but if we look up here, it doesn't make a lot of sense for it to be a constant. Um, because that means that we would expect that the whole thing, the whole bar would kind of translate. So we can kind of assume then that C1 is going to be zero. So I'm gonna get rid of C1. Leave C2, and we have these two equations here that the derivative in X has to equal to this piece, and here the derivative in Z has to equal to this piece. Because uh, we're gonna factor out the M, the M over EI. So let's just write this out. And we can see that if I integrate this expression, I get that C2 is equal to nu x squared over two, uh, plus some constant. If I integrate this one, C2 is z squared over two, plus some constant. But when I combine these together, right, this is the constant for this one, this is the constant for this one. And so all that implies then is that C2 is equal to one half. Oops, almost made a mistake there, right? So this one has to be negative because when I move that over that side, it has to be negative. So that's a negative z squared over two. This one's positive. So I get one half mu x squared minus z squared. And so that's the only piece that we pick up in this. So I can go back uh, up here we can take this constant of, of integration and we can stuff it into this expression here and we get our final result, which is simply, and there's our final result for the vertical displacement in the y direction, m over 2ei nu, which is Poisson's ratio x squared minus nu y squared minus uh, z squared. And I don't know why I keep wanting to drop this negative sign here on my z term, but it should be negative here. So this is kind of hard to visualize, so let's actually plot this function and see what it looks like. And so now here it is. So now what I've plotted is in the xy plane, which is a cross section of the beam, I've plotted my arrows, right? So my displacement field uh, points an arrow from the original configuration, which is the blue dots, right? So the blue dots are where the beginning of every arrow is, which was just a square. And then there's this vector field which points where the, where the point moves to, which is the red dot. So these points move inwards, these points move outwards, the ones in the center don't see to go anywhere, the ones in the top move in, the ones in the bottom move outwards. And so now if I just plot my collection of red dots, that would be like the final uh, state of the beam, right? So we have a curved surface here, it slopes outwards, and a curved surface here. And this kind of shape we can actually see very easily in experiment. But let me take the rubber bar here and bend it quite extreme so the effect is exaggerated. But here if we look from the top, we see that kind of bulging out like we saw in the, in the analytical solution that we just came up with. So we see that bulging out at the bottom, see? And here along the top, we see that kind of curve inwards. And it's probably a little hard to see, but along the bottom there's a little bit of a bulge outwards.
And so in fact, that shape that we just saw is actually kind of pretty representative of what we observed. So it gives us some confidence that maybe we're on uh, the right track. Anyway, you'll have to do this yourself to see it and to believe it for yourself. If you have like a simple bar eraser, that's a good way to kind of see the same uh, effect here.